Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Dr. Sudeep Bose. He served 12 years as a doctor in the U.S. Army, rising to the rank of major. He is also an Iraq War veteran who treated injuries in major combat settings and also examined Saddam Hussein following his capture. Dr. Bose is now a practicing emergency physician and is considered one of the world's leading physicians. And Dr. Bose, thanks very much for being with us. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start at the very beginning of your story. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, about fifth grade, I moved to the Chicagoland area in Naperville, Illinois, and grew up there. And uh, my parents actually came from Calcutta, India in the 1960s, from the blistering heat of Calcutta, India, to the frigid winters of North Dakota. <laughs> my, land, my parents landed, and uh, my mom was in a sari and flip-flops, and they began their life here. It's quite a culture shock, yeah. probably, <laughs> at that point. Uh, when did you decide to pursue a medical career? When? Yes. Um, pretty early on, I knew I wanted to be a physician. I mean, I went through all my stages. I wanted to be a policeman and a fireman and a mailman. And then eventually, uh, at a very young age, I watched a surgery on TV. And that kind of drew me in, and I knew I wanted to do that. Plus, coupled with that, I had a grandparent who died of a heart attack in uh, the 1980s, and uh, the that was in India, and the medical care there was not standard to what medical care is right now, so it kind of made me want to make a difference and go help people. Mm -hmm. And you went to Northwestern University? Correct. Now, were you ROTC there? No, I was not. I okay. was not. How did you get involved with the military then? So I... Um, joined the military when I was 21 years old mm -hmm. and uh, signed the dotted line and uh, was part of the Health Profession Scholarship Program and uh, went through Northwestern University and uh, did my undergraduate and my medical school training there and then did my residency and specialization in emergency medicine. And that was at Fort Hood, Texas, correct? That was, correct. correct. Was that, what was that experience like? It was a great experience. It was part of the reason that I wanted to go into the military is the specialty of emergency medicine is born out of the military. Um, from prior conflicts, medicine really advances and uh, the actual concept of emergency rooms was born out of the U.S. military in prior conflicts. So I knew the skills I gained would be excellent, the training would be excellent, and that's what drew me in, one of the reasons that drew me in. You're you seem like a, a humble guy, so you're probably not going to want to dwell on this, but when you completed your residency, you and about 3,600 other people took a test uh, gauging your expertise in emergency medicine, and you finished number one uh, in the country. You must have realized right. you were at the very top of the heap at that point. I, I think it was a great, uh, lucky experience that I got the training I did. I had incredible mentors. I had uh, great training at all the way from high school at Naperville Central High School to you know, Northwestern University to the military training at Darnell Army Medical Center. So the training was incredible, and it's actually what drew me in to actually get passionate about the field of emergency medicine, go into combat, help these soldiers who are injured on the battlefield, and then continue that. I started some uh, medical education companies that continue to educate physicians throughout the world. How well do you think your training prepared you for battlefield medicine? Obviously, with, with your residency, you saw a lot of urgent cases and, and dire cases. Uh, is, was there any way to simulate the conditions that you would later see in Iraq? It's, I guess the comparison I'd give is when you, you read about these diseases in medical school and then you go to your clinical rotations for the first time, it's different. You know, reading about you know, pancreatitis and then actually treating it is completely different. But then when you go to the military, it's a whole different level. When I first got there, you're in areas, you know, intense combat areas in Baghdad or Najaf or Fallujah, which we can talk about. And, um, you know, you just sit back and you're just like, is this for real? You know, I really have to do this. You know, these people need help. And it's a, uh, it's humbling, but it's an incredible opportunity to be there and help others. What year is it when you finish your residency? Uh, the 
Twin Towers went down in the final year of my residency. So I finished, um, no, that's not correct. The Twin Towers went down in 2001. So yes, 2002, I finished my residency. So I was in my final year of residency and uh, Twin Towers went down and that's when I knew the game would change. Um, I was right about to finish my training and finished it shortly after, got my board certification uh, through the American College of Emergency Physicians. And uh, I became a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians and uh, was fully board certified emergency medicine physician when I went out to combat. So you knew when you finished that this wasn't something that could happen during your time in service, it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen and I actually volunteered for to be attached to the 1st Cavalry Division and pretty much knew that they would be going. Mm -hmm. Initially, we thought we'd be the first wave to go. When they went into Baghdad, they went in from Kuwait, and we thought we'd be going in from Turkey. Eventually, you know, Turkey did not permit U.S. troops, so I went in on the second wave. Okay. And what was that, what was that like? It was, uh, it was an incredible experience. I think, um, you know, sitting back and reflecting on it right now, I would have never thought that this experience would teach me as much as it did. Now, on that second wave, obviously it was a pretty quick march to Baghdad. What kind of resistance did that second wave meet on the march coming out of Kuwait? Um, coming out of Kuwait, the initial journey into Baghdad was not that eventful. Um, we did have an eventful moment partly there from Kuwait to Baghdad in our vehicle. One of the tires went flat and um, when the tire went flat, you know, we had to go out and kind of change the tire. We're holding security there and there was a gentleman that luckily one of the medics spotted. He was up on a roof and he was pointing an AK-47 weapon down at us and luckily one of the medics spotted him and uh, basically shot him off the roof and probably he saved a lot of US casualties that day and it that was a powerful moment you just realize you know what you're going into at that time and also you know that same soldier who saved my life and saved other lives that day uh, Several months later, I had the chance to return the favor. He was holding security again in Baghdad, and he was shot in the back, and the bullet exited his abdomen. Um, he was lying there bleeding on a sidewalk, and his intestines were out of his body, and he was going to die. And he ended up, uh, we ended up resuscitating him. He ended up getting over 40 units of blood in theater. Basically, there was a net-wide call like any soldier with typo blood show up right here right now and they took blood from the soldier put it in him and he's alive today Amazing. and uh, and then it was just interesting to see how when you go through something like that how much that disturbed him he was a medic he was there to help people and he was disturbed that within hours of crossing he had to shoot somebody off a roof and that goes into many of the challenges our soldiers face today, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and um, other mental challenges that our soldiers are facing. What type of combat training did you have in addition to your, your medical training? You mentioned that, that the medic shot the guy off the roof. Did you go through the regular basic training? And right, so I had to go through basic training. The, um, it was interspersed within medical school. So the summers between medical school, I went to Fort Sam Houston and uh, was trained there. We did navigation training, um, you know, the physical fitness requirements of the military, the, uh, the weapons, and learning about the military. I mean, for myself, I was, you know, raised in Naperville, Illinois, and went to Northwestern, and this was new to me. So we were introduced to the military and got that training. And then combat-wise, specifically later, you know, there was combat casualty training, and um, Immediately before combat, training became pretty intense. After Baghdad fell in April of 2003, did you stay attached to the 1st Cav? And if so, where did you go from there? So Baghdad fell. I, um, 
I, it was, my deployment was with the first CAV mm -hmm. the entire time. So I was attached to the hospital in the civilian sector. I worked at Darnell Army Medical Center in Fort Hood, Texas, and then was attached to the first CAV out of Fort Hood and went with the first CAV. Um, and throughout that deployment, it ended up being a 15-month deployment with the first CAV. Wow. So between April and the time that Saddam was captured in December, uh, what, what type of areas were, were you in? What type of action uh, were you seeing at that point? So when, so during Operation Iraqi Freedom 1, Saddam Hussein uh, was not captured throughout that entire period. He, um, so during that period, I was not the first wave. I was in Fort Hood training, doing my emergency medicine. And then I went in as a second wave subsequently. And uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom 2. Gotcha. And um, that's when that encounter happened. Okay. We've got about just a minute before uh, we have to take a break here, but what was it like to get the news that not only Saddam was captured, but ultimately that, that you were going to be assigned to, to, to check him out and potentially treat him? You know, thinking back on it, it's, he's, you know, he's a brutal dictator. And we had to focus and do our job. And um, you know, that's what we're trained in, in the military and our medical training, is you have to divorce yourself from emotion and focus and do your job. And that's what I focused on doing. Dr. Bose, let's take a short break. We're uh, talking with Dr. Sudeep Bose. Uh, left the U.S. Army after 12 years, uh, rose to the rank of major. We're talking about his time in Iraq and emergency medicine. We'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. All right, thank you. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. honored to be joined in studio today by Dr. Sudeep Bose, veteran of the U.S. Army, uh, served 12 years, uh, left the Army as a major. He's an Iraq War veteran, and we just left off the conversation before the break, Dr. Bose, about what it was like to get the news that you would be face-to-face, -face, essentially, with a brutal dictator like Saddam Hussein. When you actually were face-to-face, -face, what was that experience like? It was an intense experience. Um, they choppered him in. The area was cleared, except a few key personnel remained. And there wasn't much notice. And the chopper landed. About six armed guards exited um, aside an elderly man in a wheelchair who was blindfolded and restrained and um, unshaven, unkempt, uh, disheveled. And they wheeled him to me. And as soon as he, the wheelchair was in front of me, they untied his blindfold, they untied his restraints, and he stood up. And the air was tense. You know, he looked at my weapon, and he muttered something in Arabic. And we were prepared. We, I had medicines nearby to sedate him in case he became combative. We didn't need that and proceeded with the exam. Because of you know, our training in the military and medical, we can't, there are certain things I can't disclose about that encounter, mm -hmm. but in general, it was, um, it was an experience I'll never forget. Was it a general physical that you were giving him? Uh, what exactly were you It was, evaluating? it was a checkup, a general physical. Um, whenever, you know, we're trained in the military, whenever someone's a prisoner of war, you still have to give them the highest level of medical care. Mm -hmm. And that was my job at that time because you don't want someone to go in prison and suffer from something that was missed medically. So that was my job. There's famous footage of uh, him opening his mouth and a flashlight. Was that you? Right. So that footage, that person will stay anonymous for a reason. Okay. Um, there's a lot of controversy about his care at that time. and. He was a high-profile target, and mm -hmm. you know I think there's uh, there's anonymity to that person for a reason. Mm -hmm. But um, and he was in captivity from his capture in December of 2013 until he was executed in 2007. And um, you know I have utmost respect for all my colleagues. You know the medics fellow medics, fellow physicians, and the whole team that guarded him and took care of him during that entire four years. 
Did you just have the one experience with him, or did you see him a number of times? Uh, namely one experience. Okay. Correct. Did he say anything else other than the, the one muttering? Uh, muttering, the entire history was usually done uh, through a translator. So I'm sure he spoke English, but he chose not to at that time. But he was cooperative if you asked any questions and that sort of thing? He was pretty cooperative. Okay. And I think his uh, impending fate was probably on his mind. Sure. That seemed uh, fairly obvious to me. And um, just interesting, you know, being face to face with a dictator like that. He's human, and medically, you have to treat him like any other human. And that was one of the challenging things of an experience like this is you have to divorce yourself from emotion. And that's a lesson that we can all learn in our lives in many ways. I mean, I remember, for example, one day I was eating breakfast with one of my buddies, a fellow first cavalry uh, soldier. And hours later, I'm pronouncing him dead on a sidewalk because he was shot and he was bleeding out. And that was a difficult time. But then within a few minutes of that encounter, my next patient arrived. And my patient was the insurgent who shot my friend. And I had to provide medical care for him. I had no choice. He was going to be imprisoned. I had to provide medical care. He was spitting at me, you know, kicking at me. He was uh, punching at me. He didn't want my care, but I was forced to give it. So there are many situations like this or treating Saddam where you have to divorce yourself from emotion. And often under these pressure moments, you know, whether eyes are on you because you're treating a dictator or you're treating someone who injured your friends, you have to stay objective and accomplish your mission. And I think the military does a great job of teaching that. And in medicine, it's the same way. I mean, whether you're treating you know, a family member or you're treating uh, inner city uh, patient who perhaps murdered somebody, you have to provide the same medical care. Despite the training, how difficult is that? I think um, it's, despite the training, it's difficult, but it's very doable with the training. So once you get that training, you still have to, I mean, you even just look at it physiologically, you know, we have levels of our brain. We have, you know, our primitive brain, and that primitive brain helps us breathe, it helps us digest and do certain things. And um, there are structures in there, such as like the amygdala, for example. And that's a structure in the brain, and it's kind of shaped like a, like a walnut. And it uh, helps attach emotion to a life experience. So for example, 4th of July, the amygdala may take you back to memories of hanging out with your family, you know, summer winds, barbecues. But for a soldier with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, that amygdala has a dark side. That explosion from the fireworks can trigger memories of the battlefield, and the amygdala can take you there. So what we have on top of that primitive brain is we have a cortex. So the cortex, when you peel it back, you have the primitive brain. But the cortex is what we, our upper level brain. And what I almost imagine is that we have an inner army inside our cortex that helps suppress those impulses of the primitive brain. So I think when you're dealing with trying to suppress emotions, taking care of patients, when there may be your emotional primitive brain may be telling you something different, you have to just rely on that cortex and that inner army to just kind of fight those primitive impulses so you can do your job. I mean, uh, medical providers do it all the time. Dr. Bowes, we're going to take another short break. This is amazing stuff. We'll pick up the conversation in just a moment on Veterans Chronicles. All right. Thank you. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. Our special guest in studio today is Dr. Sudeep Bose, 12 years in the U.S. Army, and he's an Iraq War veteran, spent 15 months in theater. We've talked about his training. We've talked about his examination of Saddam Hussein. And for the next uh, segment, we're certainly going to be talking about perhaps the most difficult part of, of his tour there, and that's uh, dealing with those who were injured, uh, some of them fatally, of course, in, in urban combat from Baghdad to Najaf to Fallujah. And uh, Dr. Bose, obviously, major combat operations went very smoothly by military standards. Mm -hmm. The aftermath was a different story with the rise of sectarian conflict. And um, talk about your first 
experience being with U.S. troops that encountered that sort of thing? It was interesting because when we went into Baghdad, so that's where we first went, the Qadamiya area of Baghdad, um, within about a month of getting there, a couple months, I had one of the most intense experiences of my deployment. And this was a religious holiday. There were thousands and thousands of people marching on the roads, the, uh, the faithful, the committed, uh, celebrating their holiday. And in that crowd were 12 men. And these 12 men were strapped with bombs. And all of a sudden, boom, the bombs explode. These uh, suicidal bombers injured a lot of people in the process. And I was about 800 meters from the scene, had to roll to the scene, uh, had a physician assistant, a stellar physician assistant by the name of Dean Stalls helping me. I had uh, a few medics. And all of a sudden, there's dozens to hundreds of bodies just lying on the ground. And that was my first kind of wake-up call to what combat medicine was like. One physician, a few staff, and dozens and dozens of bodies on the ground. And the question is, you know, who do you go to first? Um, who will you be unable to help? And these are tough decisions because if you go to the loudest screamer, that's not necessarily the person who needs to help. They're going to survive. Their airway works. Or you go to someone whose care is medically futile. They're not going to survive their injuries. And you use your limited backpack full of supplies and 45 minutes trying to save someone who's not going to be saved anyway. There's about 12 other lives you could have saved who won't be saved. So you have to make these decisions about prioritizing or triaging, which is the essence of military medicine. And um, so urban combat, first thing I learned is it's not one patient. It's multiple patients when an explosion goes off. And you have to be ready to prioritize. You have to be ready to, you have the supplies you have, and you need to know how to use them appropriately. And to make difficult decisions, like giving someone comfort measures and recognizing when to let go, and what can wait, and who your immediate first bleeders are. And I think that translates to everything. It translates to corporate America. It translates to your life as a parent. It translates in every single way of uh, when, the, figuratively speaking, the bomb goes off in your life, and you need to figure out what to prioritize and what to let go. These are important lessons. Was it? Difficult to triage. I mean, when when you're when you're in that situation, uh, you have obviously had a, a lot of training at this point. But do you instinctively know? I mean, you you explained before it's not necessarily the screamer, it's not this or that necessarily. But is it? Do you just go into a mode where you you can pretty qu clearly tell which ones you need to go to? I first? think that's a big part of the training. And in emergency medicine, the same process goes on when you go into an emergency room, you may wait for several hours because it's not always first come, first serve. It's sickest come, first serve. So if you're there with, for a sore throat, for example, um, someone comes in with a heart attack, rightfully so, they're going to go in front of you, and you're going to end up waiting. So it's the same kind of concept in this situation, except it's amplified, and you're probably under fire and getting attacked in the process, which makes it even more amplified. And then um, the one thing that I learned that was, it, it struck me right away is that when the adrenaline's in your body, everything's just slow motion and you, you see what really matters. And I saw the medics that I trained just autonomously. They were starting airways. They were starting IVs. They were trying tourniquets. And I was very, very thankful at that moment that we took the time to train those medics because um, one physician can't do that alone. But I learned the importance of multiplying your team because by training the medics, I essentially multiplied myself. And we were able to treat the patients there, and nobody immediately died, which is pretty amazing in a situation like that. So um, 
same concept. You have to multiply your teams, you have to triage appropriately, and that ties into all elements of our life, even outside of urban combat. Sure. You mentioned that things kind of went in slow motion. I've heard elite athletes say that in big moments in games that that, right. that, that happens. Is, is, that, is that an indication to you that while you're never necessarily prepared for everything that's going to happen in a, in a theater like that, that you feel like you've got as good of a handle as you can possibly get on it? That, that is. I mean, I think there are certain physiologic things that go on in your bodies that create those flashbulb memories. And we all have them in our life where just certain moments are like flashbulb memories and you remember those. And um, this was definitely one of those. You know, physiologically speaking, we have a system in our body that back in the day when we saw a saber-toothed tiger, uh, there was a series of events that went on from everything from the stimulus going to your eye, you seeing it, going up the optic nerve, triggering areas in the brain, which secretes hormones from your pituitary, to the two adrenal glands that sit atop your kidneys, which secrete adrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine. It secretes those kind of fight or flight hormones. So we go into this fight, flight, or freeze mode. And you just have to know when you're there in those moments of pressure, you have an option. You fight, flight, or you freeze. And often if you freeze, that's where you're going to get in trouble. So the training in the military, the training in medicine is you can't freeze in those moments. And you have to know that this is what your body's doing. It's kind of like that primitive brain we talked about. There's certain things going on in your body. You can't control that. It's back from our saber-toothed tiger days. And you just have to be able to use that inner army in your brain to just realize you're there, your body's reacting normally, and go forward and do your mission. You just gave the example of the, the very gripping account of the, the multiple bombings in, in Baghdad. You're also a veteran of the Second Battle of Fallujah, which is perhaps the most intense battle of the Iraq War. Since Vietnam, it's probably the most intense battle. That's what they say is um, since 1968 in Vietnam, there was a just as intense battle, but very, very intense. Patients uh, just coming in minute by minute. And most of my care was frontline care, which is forward care. So you can kind of compare that to a, a paramedic in an ambulance now. We're rolling around in vehicles, taking care of patients, and pre-hospital, so not, you know, before they even get to a tent with the hospital. So I, it was amazing to see, you know, in that situation, you have to provide leadership, and you have to provide medical leadership to take care of patients in such volume so that they survive. And we had to set up the systems for those, uh, for the survival so we could take care of those patients. And it was amazing to see how medicine evolved, some of the things we did. Just having, you know, myself, uh, the medics forward saved so many lives because it's that golden hour where you bleed out and you die. So you get someone there to aggressively stop the bleeding on the front lines. So one day when we look back, this war, we'll see that you know, there was a team that went out there and they faced barriers, they faced difficulties, but they did the right thing. And the right thing was stopping bleeding at that moment, tying tourniquets. Uh, certain wars, they thought tourniquets were bad. They saved lives. There were new dressings that were out, um, dressings that had, for example, like shrimp and lobster shells within it. That's chitosan, the active substance. So it contacts blood and it it becomes hard, like a shrimp or a lobster shell, basically, and it stops bleeding. Because if you completely lose your arm and leg, we saw lots of injuries like that, you can't get a tourniquet proximal to it. We learned about uh, how to resuscitate patients with fluid. Uh, instead of just giving bags and bags of IV fluid, give them blood quicker. We learned the correct ratios of how much blood to how much fluid to give. And patients are benefiting from that today in the civilian sector. We did damage control surgery where, you know, we cut people open and we would stop the immediate bleeders. Um, there were times I had to crack people's chests open, spread their ribs, there's a hole in their heart, you plug it. And then often patients did not get closed up until they got to Germany. So we'd leave them open, they'd fly to Germany and they closed them there in a more controlled setting. So these are things that happened in this war. And you know, the leadership provided here made me think of 
prior leadership in prior wars, for example, you know, I'm talking about the Second Battle of Fallujah, I'm talking about Iraq, but in the Civil War, before the Civil War, there were no hospitals. And after the Civil War, we developed hospitals in the United States. There were no medical records. And I'm not sure how thankful I am for that, because charting <laughs> is like the bane of doctors' existence. But medical records are important, and medical records came out of the Civil War. And then in World War I, we began hanging blood. In World War II, penicillin. In the Korean War, we learned about air evacuation. In the Vietnam War, shortly after that, uh, there was a surgeon in the United States who realized, who had a death of a family member and realized that, hey, you know, the survival rate's higher in Vietnam than it is on the highways of Los Angeles. So trauma care improved after Vietnam and continued today to Fallujah. So now what inspires me is when I look at an amputee, you know, I used to see that amputated leg and I used to think, of blood, pain, tears. And now I think of hope because, you know, that soldier who was on Bunker Hill and was uh, dying in the Revolutionary War from an amputation had no hope of antibiotics. They didn't exist, of hospitals. They didn't exist. Uh, couldn't get blood. Blood transfusion didn't exist. Airplanes didn't exist. Air evacuation. So now that soldier can survive today because of all the medical advancements in combat. And now we have a new set of challenges. They have their physical abrasions, they survive these, and they come back and they have mental abrasions, you know, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress. I don't like to add the D on it. I don't think it's a disorder. It's post-traumatic stress. So it's, um, it's, and we're going to tackle these too. I mean, one day we'll look back and these patients who survive and suffer from these things, you know, we'll tackle that suicide rate that at the date of this recording, it's about 22 veterans a day, one almost every hour committing suicide. So they survive the battlefield, they come back and commit suicide. So that's our problem today that we have to deal with, and we will. And you're working very actively correct. with that. You have an organization uh, that you're very close to as well, correct? Correct. I founded uh, an organization called The Battle Continues. It's a nonprofit uh, charity that helps injured veterans. So what I'm proud about with this is 100% of the donations go to the injured veterans. So if someone donates a $20 bill, it all goes to injured veterans. There's no staff getting paid. There's no overhead costs. You know, I cover that myself and with other uh, uh, venues and other businesses I've started. And um, that entire money can go to the injured veteran. And I th I'm passionate about that. And, but when you don't have an advertising budget, when you 100% is going to veterans, so I really depend on you know, it's grassroots. I depend on word of mouth, people spreading the word. But anybody who makes the donation gets their tax deduction, and all of it goes to help an injured veteran. So I'm passionate about that, and I think it's important to continue to serve after coming back. You don't need a uniform to serve, and that's my way of giving back to injured veterans. I do a lot of corporate speaking on leadership, on leadership under pressure from the perspective of the emergency room and combat. So whatever I make, speaking uh, helps fund the overhead costs for the battle continues and then um, whatever's donated goes to the injured veteran. And go ahead and give the website. It's thebattlecontinues.org so www.thebattlecontinues.org. Fantastic. About a minute before our next break, um, what do you see as the most helpful therapies or treatments to soldiers who have post-traumatic stress or tra traumatic brain injury? The most uh, helpful treatment, right now we're still learning. Uh, at the time of this recording, we're still learning. We still have a high veteran suicide rate, and it's hard to detect these patients because um, there's different categories of symptoms. There's hallucinations. There's reliving the event. You wake up with nightmares. That's pretty easy to identify. But then there's a segment of the population that just kind of withdraws, and they withdraw from what they love doing, their passions, their families. And those are the ones that are hard to detect. They don't go for medical care, and they're having to struggle within, and it's detecting those patients. So I think, to answer your question, education, and removing the stigma that it's um, OK, that if you're a tough, macho soldier, it's OK to feel this when you come back. It's not a disorder. And 
educating family members and others to maybe seek help. And then I can go into more details on cognitive therapies and things like that. But I think for the broad public, it's education, removing the stigma, and just supporting our veterans. Depending on what you read, 0.5% of the U.S. population experiences combat. So there's a disconnect from the rest of the population who don't understand necessarily what that soldier's been through. That soldier may be in the office cubicle next to you. It may be your next door neighbor. It may be your brother. And we need to be able to help those guys by education. And that's what I focus on with The Battle Continues. TheBattleContinues.org is the site. We're talking with Dr. Sudeep Bose. We'll be back for our final segment on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. We're joined today by Dr. Sudeep Bose, a veteran of the Iraq War, U.S. Army Major, uh, during his time in service to this country. And sir, you've painted such a vivid picture of your time in Baghdad and Fallujah, and we'll talk about Najaf in just a moment. You were talking about being a doctor in a forward area. How close are you to the action at this point since you're treating people who are just injured? Very close. Uh, that was one of the major changes of this war is moving care forward and recognizing that the number one cause of death will be hemorrhage or bleeding out. So let's move that care forward and provide that care immediately to prevent that bleeding out so patients don't die on the way to the combat support hospital. Um, I spent about 95% of my time forward, and then about 5% of the time I spent in the hospital, in the combat support hospital. Particularly, it was the 31st Combat Support Hospital, Ibn Sina. This was a hospital that was Saddam Hussein's personal hospital until the U.S. soldiers took it over and made it the U.S. Combat Support Hospital. In previous wars, certainly since the Geneva Convention came about, one of the things that even warring parties could agree on is once the medical personnel come in, let them do their job. You're not fighting against a uniformed enemy here. These are radical terrorists. So did they honor that, or, or were you under as much of a threat as, as some of the troops? For some reason, it did not seem that that rule applied. <laughs> and um, it, also, whenever someone's a physician or even the battalion commander, you don't want to stand out. You know, you don't want a uh, shiny rank that reflects. You don't want that to be obvious. So you blend in with everyone else. You wear the same uniform. You're carrying the M16. You're carrying the 9 millimeter, And you're forward. It's urban combat. So, you know, you think of combat from prior wars. It's force on force. You know, you picture the old wars where people run across a field from both sides. That was not necessarily always the case. In Baghdad, which was a high profile target because it's the capital city, uh, people were setting improvised explosive devices. There were bombs in the road, there were bombs in vehicles, there were bombs in themselves, in animals, and bombs everywhere. And the enemy was often invisible. They were maybe firing out of buildings and you don't see them. So it wasn't quite that force on force. And um, it was challenging providing care. So you're, in a way, you can say you're forward because you, there isn't a front line in that sense. But what was, and we had to set up, that was strategically different because we had to set up the systems, you know, providing the medical leadership, I had to set up the systems to be able to provide care in whatever part of the city needed it and providing the right assets there. So that was challenging to be able to provide that leadership so that soldiers can survive. And that meant getting people there to stop that bleeding. But when you go to like Najaf, mm -hmm. for example, or even Fallujah, it was different. It wasn't bombs in the road. There were bombs on the road, but that became force on force. So the situation is uh, Najaf, Iraq, captured in 2003 by the US forces. There's mm -hmm. battle over the control of the city. So we're in August 2004. The Muqtada al-Sadr militia is fighting U.S. forces, specifically our unit, uh, for control of the city. And the battlefield ends up being a cemetery. Not a cemetery, the cemetery. The largest cemetery in the world, the most dense cemetery in the world. So, for example, you right now are sitting about eight feet away from me. There would be about 15 tombstones between us. And if you just Google cemetery uh, Najaf, Iraq, you can see how dense that is. 
and you're on the battlefield and you're literally hiding behind tombstones hearing you know weapons coming and hitting that tombstone and then you're getting up and firing and the battlefield is force on force so that's different than Iraq so what we learned there is we had to provide medical leadership when it's force on force just like Fallujah was and um, it's force on force in a cemetery to add to that um, their underground catacombs where soldier, you know, the oppo opposition would, uh, the insurgents would pop up and basically sneak behind you through underground tunnels and pop up behind these tombstones. So it's very intense combat in the middle of this cemetery. And for example, we had a patient who was in his tank and someone jumped up on a tombstone onto the tank, went into the tank, shot his weapon, and hit the soldier. So the leadership we had to provide there is providing care for that soldier when you're still being fired and there are bullets hitting those tombstones as you're trying to pull him out and um, providing that care on the scene and trying to stop his bleeding and save him. So that's what is meant by front line. Um, when you think of combat, you may picture the hospital to be a hospital in the rear with operating rooms, and that did exist, but there was a lot of medical care going on forward to that. And that's where I spent probably about 90, 95% of my time. And I think that is, medically speaking, what we'll look back on and see how lives were saved, is stopping that bleeding and hemorrhage control out of the Iraq war. Last topic, it just it sounds, and, and you explained this so well about the advancement in medicine from war to war and how that's impacted civilian medical care as well, but just how well thought out uh, the medical system is uh, in the military and, and how smooth it seemed to, to run, even though the, the mission itself at times mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly ran into some, some challenges. Uh, but from forward care to the hospitals there to uh, medevacing and, and, and everything else, it seems like it was about as structured as smartly as it could have been. Was that your assessment as well? I think so. I mean, I think you learn as you go along, and it's about setting up systems. And the military is very organized. It's very hierarchical. Like, when you have a commanding officer tell you an order, you follow that order. And you trust your commanding officers that they have the bigger picture than you do. So when they tell you not to engage or to engage, that's for a reason. And by following that structured hierarchy, uh, we were able to handle those situations. By the training we learned medically, we were able to handle those situations. And even the combat training, we were able to handle those situations. Because a lot of times, the biggest concern became scene safety, making sure the scene is safe. If you know there's someone lying on the ground, and you chop her in, or you come in, and then you get shot in the process, that doesn't accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure the scene is safe, and that's an important lesson to learn as well. Dr. Bose, it's an incredible story, and you're still doing fantastic work uh, in emergency medicine. And as you mentioned, you're public speaking, encouraging people to learn the lessons of not only high-pressure situations, but uh, uh, all the other things you've learned through your uh, career for our country. Uh, thank you very much for your service, and thank you very much for your time with us today. Thank you. I think uh, it's a big honor. I think back to my parents and... Uh, uh, they came here in the 1960s with literally eight dollars in their pocket and landing in the cold of North Dakota and how people just welcomed my parents they took care of my parents and um, my parents quickly learned that America is the land of opportunity and you know it's quickly instilled into me that you need to serve you need to give back and this is a great country and I think it's a diverse, great country where anybody can go serve and um, serve back a country that was so great to me personally and to my parents. Fantastic story from start to finish. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Sudeep Bose, veteran of the Iraq War. Uh, after his 12 years in the Army, he had the rank of major, and he is listed as one of the world's greatest physicians. I'm Greg Corumbus. This has been Veterans Chronicles.